the original Nintendo Game Boy released in 1989, allowing Nintendo to further their dominance in the video game industry outside of just the living room. The novelty of having your favorite video game characters with you on the go was something that resonated with not just young children, but everyone. The Game Boy was an instant success. Despite numerous hardware revisions and successors over the years, no other Game Boy branded device would ever come close without selling the original gray brick. With sales within the range of 118 million units, the Game Boy solidified Nintendo as the leader of the handheld market. However, the Game Boy wasn't Nintendo's first foray into the portable gaming industry. Oh no, the company was making games under the Game & Watch brand of portable devices as early as 1980. So today, let's go back and explore the history of the Nintendo Game Boy. Now you can't talk about the Game Boy without first talking about Gunpei Yokoi. Long before Nintendo entered the video game industry, Yokoi was a maintenance man at one of the company's Hanafuda card factories. During his spare time, he liked to design little toys and devices for his own amusement. One day, while Hiroshi Yamauchi, president of Nintendo at the time, was visiting, he noticed a rather odd looking device that Yokoi had made. It was an extending grabbing arm. Impressed, Yamauchi ordered Yokoi to make a proper device for mass production in time for the holiday season. Yokoi called it the Ultra Hand, and it went on to be a huge success for the company. As a result, Yokoi was asked to continue working on toy designs for Nintendo, and would develop several more over the course of his career such as 10 Billion Puzzle Barrels, The Ultra Machine, and a Love Tester. Now of course, Nintendo wouldn't remain in the toy business for much longer. The company would shift focus in 1974 and begin to produce video games. Yokoi was kept on board and became one of the company's first video game designers, eventually working with Miyamoto to bring the Donkey Kong and Super Mario Bros. arcade games to the masses. As for the Game Boy, well its origins can be traced back to one seemingly ordinary train ride. As the story goes, while Yokoi was traveling one afternoon, he saw a bored businessman playing with an LCD calculator to pass the time. This inspired him to create a clock that would double as a handheld video game device, hence the name Game & Watch. The Game & Watch series would predate the Game Boy and it lasted from 1980 to 1986. The handhelds themselves had several design revisions over the years. Elements of these would stick around and impact the industry for years to come. The now commonplace D-pad? Well, you can thank the 1982 Game & Watch release of Donkey Kong for that one. Not to mention, a multi-screen clamshell design that would later inspire the Nintendo DS and 3DS line of handhelds. The Game & Watch series of games featured mostly generic characters, although a few units did feature prominent Nintendo properties such as Super Mario and The Legend of Zelda. Now the character Mr. Game & Watch himself is actually just an amalgamation of all the characters featured in the Game & Watch series of portables. His first real appearance as the illustrious Mr. Game & Watch was in Super Smash Bros. Melee in the form of a playable fighter. His moveset and design was of course inspired by the classic Game & Watch series of games. Now while the Game & Watch series of portables were fairly popular at the time, they all shared a few similar issues. For one, each device could only play one game. The LCD screens were pre-printed with images to supplement the need for actual graphics, and the games themselves, well, they were rather rudimentary to say the least. By 1989, it was clear the Game & Watch series was obsolete. However, they proved that portable gaming had mass appeal, and other companies took notice. Sega was getting ready to release their own handheld console called the Game Gear, and Atari was busy hyping up the release of their handheld, the Atari Lynx. Not to mention, the Turbo Express by NEC was also lying in wake. Nintendo needed to answer with something of their own, or risk being left behind in the handheld market. They said it wasn't humanly possible, but now you can have all the power and excitement of Nintendo right in the palm of your hand. Introducing Game Boy. It's portable, it's in stereo, and its games are interchangeable. Game Boy, only from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power, portable power. And so, hoping for another hit, Nintendo tasked Gunpei Yokoi in their Research and Development 1 department with creating Nintendo's follow-up to the Game Watch series of handhelds, the Game Boy. The Game Boy took a lot of inspiration from the NES. It featured a cartridge slot so that games could be purchased separately and changed in a matter of seconds. This solved one of the Game & Watch's biggest flaws, needing to buy an entirely new system just to play a different game. It also used the same controller layout, including the now iconic D-pad and four total face buttons. Its overall design was similar to the NES as well, right down to the grey paint with dark grey accents, 
and indents on the back to mimic the vents of the NES. All of this was crammed into a somewhat portable package, and Yakuya had one general philosophy when developing hardware. He called it lateral thinking with wither technology, which more or less means rather than using newer, complicated, and more expensive technologies, he would focus on how to make the best of older technology that is better understood so it could be mass produced at a much lower cost. This design philosophy would be one of the main reasons as to why the Game Boy performed so well despite being objectively worse than the competition. You see, Sega's Game Gear, the Atari Lynx, and even NEC's Turbo Express all featured much more powerful processors, color screens, backlights, and more. While on paper these features seem great, they all came at a cost. The units were bulky and less portable than the Game Boy, and the battery life was abysmal, oftentimes requiring more batteries for less game time. Not to mention, the price of these units were significantly higher than that of the Game Boy. Now by comparison, the Game Boy was rather simple. It used a monochrome LCD screen, only capable of showing four different shades of a greenish gray color. There was no backlight, which left players with no choice but to find their own source of light to see the screen clearly. But perhaps most importantly, it was cheap and it required less batteries. Yokoi knew that keeping costs down and maximizing battery life were going to be key if they wanted to take over the handheld market. Thus, the Game Boy was priced at only $90 upon release, $60 less than Sega's Game Gear, half as much as the Atari Lynx, and a whopping $210 cheaper than NEC's Turbo Express. On top of that, the Game Boy was far more portable. Although it's bulky by today's standards, it's still possible to fit in a pocket, which couldn't be said about the other portable offerings at the time. Plus, it only used four AA batteries while everyone else was using six. The Game Boy would often last for upwards of 25 hours of game time, while its competitors would get around five, if you were lucky. However, all of that would mean nothing if there wasn't anything worth playing, and Nintendo had the perfect launch title, Tetris. Tetris was originally developed for the PC by Alexei Pavlovsky and gained massive popularity among the PC gaming crowd. In comes Hank Rogers. Rogers originally saw Tetris at a trade show in Las Vegas and became completely enamored with the game. So much so that he pursued the rights to publish the game and being savvy enough to know about the upcoming launch of the Game Boy, he approached the head of Nintendo of America at the time, Minoru Arakawa, with the idea, make Tetris the pack and title for the Game Boy in North America. Now originally, Arakawa was skeptical. Nintendo had already planned to ship the Game Boy with Super Mario Land instead. But Rogers argued with his now famous quote by saying, a Mario game would sell the Game Boy to young boys. Tetris would sell to everyone. Somehow Rogers managed to sway the mind of Arakawa and Tetris was packaged with the Game Boy upon release. The risk paid off. The Game Boy and Tetris took the world by storm. The Game Boy itself would sell over 40,000 units on its first day. Today, the console has sold over 44 million units in just North America, with Tetris not far behind, selling a reported 35 million copies. Including Tetris with the Game Boy made the handheld appeal to more than just the average video game enthusiast at the time. It was reported that 46% of Game Boy owners were female, a massive jump over Nintendo's home console demographics. Despite its slower processor, monochrome screen, and lack of a backlight, the affordability of the Game Boy combined with its inviting library of games was enough to catapult the system to worldwide acclaim and completely take over the market. Sega, Atari, and NEC just couldn't compete with Nintendo's little gray brick. Now that's not to say there wasn't room for improvement. The original Game Boy was just the beginning. Over the course of the handheld's lifespan, Nintendo released a number of hardware revisions and improvements to the device, starting in 1995 with the Play It Loud series. This revision didn't change anything on the hardware side of things, instead, all the changes were made aesthetically. The Play It Loud series featured several different colored shells like red, green, yellow, black, white, or blue, and even a completely transparent model. But one year later in 1996, Nintendo would release the first major revision to the Game Boy called the Game Boy Pocket. Now the Game Boy Pocket was simply a smaller, slimmer version of the Game Boy. The screen size was slightly reduced and changed to a true black and white display over the original greenish gray color of the monochrome one, and only required two AA batteries instead of four, which did limit the device's battery life, but because it still didn't include a backlight, it was possible to get up to 10 hours of play before needing a change. Overall, the Game Boy Pocket is a nice alternative to the original Game Boy, and its slimmer design makes it much easier to carry around with you. But I know for me, I'll always prefer the original Grey Brick the most. Then in 1998, Nintendo would release a Japanese exclusive version of the Game Boy called the Game Boy Lite. 
It's marginally bigger than the Game Boy Pocket, but its claim to fame is of course the fact that it finally included an illuminated screen. It was only ever available in two colors, gold and silver. And it's a shame that this version of the Game Boy never made it outside of Japan because I imagine it would have sold relatively well here in the States. However, that's probably because Nintendo had other plans, and they were getting ready to release the biggest change to the Game Boy yet. By 1998, sales of the Game Boy line were starting to slow down in North America. But Nintendo wasn't really too worried because they had an ace up their sleeve. Well really, two to be more precise, Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue. Pokemon released earlier in Japan in 1996, but was later brought over to North America in 1998 and, well, I think we all know how that turned out. Pokemon became a smash hit, and it renewed interest in the Game Boy brand. Striking while the iron was hot, Nintendo released the Game Boy Color to the world, and it became the perfect way to complement the Pokemon craze that was sweeping the nation. As the name suggests, the Game Boy Color's primary selling point was its color screen. Games were no longer in black and white or monochrome green. The Game Boy Color could even add up to 10 color channels to older Game Boy games by way of preset color palettes. Some games were even programmed with enhanced Game Boy Color specific palettes which allowed them to use up to 16 colors. This allowed the Game Boy Color to breathe new life into the entire library of existing Game Boy games, and it quickly propelled the Game Boy back into the limelight. The system was only slightly thicker than the Game Boy Pocket, and it still didn't feature a backlight, but that didn't stop it from selling over 44 million units in North America alone, becoming another commercial success for Nintendo, and cementing the Game Boy line of portables as the number one handheld in the entire world. The success of the original Game Boy was twofold. Gunpei Yokoi's design philosophy of using older technology to keep costs down, along with Nintendo's ability to release software with mainstream appeals such as Tetris and Pokemon, really propelled the Game Boy to worldwide acclaim. In 2009, the original grey brick Game Boy was inducted into the National Toy Hall of Fame, and its games are still being sold digitally and played today via Nintendo's virtual console and eShop services. Nintendo would continue the Game Boy line well into the 2000s with its successor the Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Advance SP, and the Game Boy Micro. These devices were the natural evolution of the Game Boy, featuring entirely new hardware specifications that allowed for games with better graphics, sound, and more colors than the original Game Boy. On top of that, starting with the Game Boy Advance SP, the system would finally include some sort of illuminated screen. However, all that might be for a video some other day. The Game Boy branding would finally be retired in 2003 with the announcement of the Nintendo DS. It's been 30 years since the launch of the original Game Boy, but its legacy and impact can be seen today. If the Game Boy was Nintendo's first attempt at bringing a console experience on the go, then the Switch is them finally achieving that goal. It might be a stretch to say, but that might not have been possible without the success of the Nintendo Game Boy.